like, what's the dream of? What's the hope in? What's the doubt for? Live to no end. This is living. The life I've been given is a gift. If I'm a living, I'm a living to death. So what's the dream of? What's the hope in? What's the doubt for? And live to no end. This is living. The life I've been given is a gift. If I'm a living, I'm a living to death. All right, everybody, welcome to the Living Hope Agency call. I couldn't be more excited for our topic tonight. We're going to be talking about um, how to leverage the financial inventory. So the financial inventory, if you guys have not used the financial inventory, this call is for you. Um, This call is for anybody who's looking to build more value in the home. This call is for anybody who's looking to um, really create a structure to their in-home and understand that the financial inventory is the foundation to everything that we do. So let me go ahead and pull up the financial inventory just so if you guys have not seen it, most of you guys have seen it, you use it every single day, but the financial inventory is one of the most powerful tools that we have. So if you go to the Family First Life America website, you can see we've got our carrier credibility sheet and then the financial inventory. So the financial inventory really simply guys is a piece of paper that you can use whether in the home or doing your telesale. And the goal is to fill this out, fill out every single question. And you use this to be able to paint the picture of the solution that you're going to be providing to the client. I think that's really important. So I'm going to stop sharing just for a second. We'll come back to it. But the financial inventory is a way that you can paint a picture back to the client of you know what their financial situation is going to look like if you know for their beneficiary whoever that is whether it's their surviving spouse it's their kids their grandkids their niece their nephew it doesn't matter they filled out their request their lead for a reason it's our job obviously to find out why they filled it out and then once we go through and we open and we set the table we get into the financial inventory so i'm not going to this isn't a set the table training but it's as simple as you know you're on the phone you're doing a telesale you're in the home hey here's who i am Here's why we're here. Hey, most people typically fill these out for X, Y, Z reason. I'm assuming that's what you were looking for. Hey, so here's how today's going to work. I'm a broker. I can shop around. I don't work for any one particular insurance carrier. So we're going to shop around for you. And I'm non-captive. Just means I don't have any loyalty to anybody. My job's to make a recommendation for you. My job's to help you. It doesn't matter to me who you end up with or even if you end up with anybody. My job's just to make a recommendation. So here's how it's going to work today. We're going to spend two minutes on your health, two minutes on your finance. Based on how you answer those questions, I'm going to make a recommendation for you. I'm going to show you a couple of options. And if we see something that makes sense, we're going to submit a request for coverage. Sound fair? Yes, sounds fair. They've now given you permission to get into it. Now, the financial inventory is really, this is where it comes in. You can just literally read off of the financial inventory and just ask them the questions. Now, obviously, there's going to be times when you do this for a long enough time. The financial inventory is your weapon. It's, it's everything. And you start to learn how to ask questions that even aren't on the financial inventory to get clarity for things that are, because we're trying to, again, figure out what their situation is. So we're going to go ahead and we're just going to break down, you know, quickly example how to fill out a financial inventory. Then we'll give a couple of examples of ways you can dig a little bit deeper into the financial inventory. So let's say I'm sitting down with, I'm sitting down with Sam here. Okay. You know, Sam, single dude, you know, he's, you know, he's widowed you know, 77 wants to leave some money behind for, you know, his son. Okay. So I sat down with Sam. Hey, you know, Sam, real quick, confirm your date of birth for me. Oh, it's, uh, you know, June 5th, 1945. Okay. So how old does that make you? 77. Okay, perfect. And you're retired, correct? So I'm filling the occupation section. Yep. Retired. Okay. Now, how do we make up that income? Is that social security? Is that pension? Is that retirement? Now, you got to ask these questions because a lot of times they'll be like, okay, and how much did you get in Social Security? And I just assume that's all they have. And they go, well, I get $900 a month in Social Security. And that's all I ever ask. And then when I started to learn to ask, what about pensions? What about retirements? The guys, well, I actually have a VA pension. It's another $4,000 a month. You know, it's like, you got to learn how to ask the questions and dig a little bit deeper. Is that your only form of income? Is there any other sources of income for the household? Well, I also work part-time, you know, and you want to go ahead and figure out their exact monthly, do you want to figure out exactly what they have coming in? Now I say a lot of words like ballpark because it reduces sales pressure with the client. Hey, ballpark, what are you bringing in per month? Ballpark, how much is your social security? Ballpark, how much is your pension? Ballpark, how much is your retirement? Now Sam's still working. He's not claiming retirement. Hey, ballpark, how much are you bringing in from your work? What do you do? I'm an electrician. Okay. And ballpark, how much do you bring home? 4,000. Okay, perfect. I'm just writing that in. 
It's as simple as that. And let's just say this is a normal, you know, life insurance appointment. It's not necessarily mortgage protection. Hey, do you own or do you rent this home? Well, we rent. Okay. How much do you pay in rent? A thousand bucks. So what I do, I circle rent and I write a thousand dollars. Now mortgage term, all that stuff doesn't matter because they're renting. Okay. How much is your monthly rent payment? A thousand bucks. We already got that. Now, if it's a mortgage, I own it. Okay. How much do you owe? 230,000. How much is the home worth? 500,000. Okay. So if it's worth 500 and you owe 230, we've got about 370 in equity. Does that sound right? Yeah, it sounds right. Okay, perfect. And how long is the term on the loan? 15, 20, 30 years, 30 years. You know, when you fill this out, was it a refi or a brand new purchase? What's your monthly payment? Okay, perfect. My goal here, obviously, you know, if you're doing a mortgage protection appointment, you want to know how much you need to protect, but I'm trying to figure out what they bring in and what is going out. Okay, so how much money they bring in and what are their expenses ballpark that are going out? We'll talk about underwriting here in a second when it comes to medications, but I want to know on a really basic level, what do they ballpark have left over? That's my goal without doing it in a way that makes them feel like they're being interrogated. I think that's really important as well. So, you know, let's say, you know, Sam makes, you know, 4,000 a month and his rent's a thousand. So I go, okay, so 4,000 a month in income, you've got a thousand dollars in rent. And this is stuff I write in the margin now. Ballpark, how much do you have going out in car, in car payments? Anything? Oh no, we don't have a car payment. Okay, gotcha. So, out, so then I say things like, so outside of your rent payment and, you know, your basic utilities, phone, internet, insurance, food, you know, you don't have any other, you know, major debts or loans or anything like that. No, no, we're good. Or they say, oh yeah, I also have a motorcycle payment. I also have this. I also have that. Hey, ballpark for me. How much do you think your utilities are? Ballpark for me. How much do you think your cell phone bill is? Your internet. I want to find out what's coming in and what's going out. So let's say he's got a thousand going out in rent and I go, okay, so if I had to guess, and I always overestimate, if I had to guess single guy living alone, your expenses are probably around 2000 a month. So I just guess, and I always overestimate. So that's like 150 a week in food and grocery. And you know, the rest 400 bucks in utilities and to pay $400 in utilities living in an apartment is kind of ridiculous. That's like house utilities. And they go, Oh no, a little bit less than that. So I always overestimate. So now I go, okay, so you got 4,000 coming in, 2000 going out. So you take ballpark, you have about 2000 left over. Yeah, that's something like that. Okay, and are you putting it in the bank? You saving it? Yeah, no, I'm trying to save it. Now I know I've got two thousand dollars to play with. Okay, another example: Bob and Mary. Bob is fifty five. Mary's forty five. They're both still working. And Bob, what do you do for work? I drive a truck. Mary, what do you do? I'm a stay at home mom, but I've got a little side hustle. Okay. And Bob, what do you ballpark bring in? Five thousand a month. Mary, what do you bring in? About seven hundred a month. Okay, so now. I keep that in mind for later when I come back and I'm going to paint them the picture of what I found. You know, it's really simple where I go, so you guys would agree that if something happened to Bob and you guys have about $2,000 in expenses and Bob makes 5,000 and, you know, Mary, you make 700. If Bob passes away, Mary, what are you going to do to pay for those expenses? Well, I'm not going to be able to, you know, so you use what's on the paper. You use what you found to be able to paint the picture back to the client. So the way that I look at the financial inventory, and I think it's so important that you have to look at this, is think about when you went to a doctor when you didn't know what was wrong with you. So you've got this, this terrible cold, but there's some flu-like symptoms to it, and you're coughing really hard, but then like you're having a headache, and you're not really sure what's going on, you know, it could, but then your stomach hurts too, and you're like, well, I don't really know, like, do I have a cold, do I have the flu, like, do I have pneumonia, like, what, what is this? I have no idea. So what do you do? You go to a professional, and you tell them your symptoms. The doctor asks you some questions, you answer those questions, and then the doctor gives you what he thinks is wrong. He gives you a prognosis. Then he prescribes you a solution. You are the doctor. The client is the patient. Your financial inventory is how you develop your prognosis. Okay. I'm using a lot of big words here. It's how we get ready to give our recommendation based on what we found on the piece of paper. Now, people are approved for life insurance based on their age and their health. They're also approved based on some risk factors. You know, are they a felon? You know, do they do risky sports on the weekends? That kind of stuff. But mostly it's their health, their height, their weight, and their age. But we also need to make sure they can afford it. So the financial inventory, it's a twofold approach. 
what can they qualify for? What can they afford? What can they qualify for? What can they afford? So you got to keep that in your mind. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm trying to find out what they can actually get because people can say, you know, I want $2 million in coverage and they might have the income to do it. I make 20,000 a month, but you're on, you're on blood thinners and you had a stint put in last week. You're not getting 2 million. So like you have to be able to show them on paper that that's why that's not happening medications. So when I start asking the client medications, medical conditions, um, I always like to start with the medical conditions. I use these as my knockout questions. As you start to do underwriting more and more, you'll realize what is accepted by a certain carrier and what's not accepted by a certain carrier. And the whole goal, I'll back up just a little bit, the whole goal of filling out this financial inventory when you're brand new, to fill out the entire thing, to take a picture of it and send it to your manager. Let your manager help you, tell you what product to write, tell you how to pitch it, how to sell it. You know, if you're in the home, you call your manager. We'll dig into how to do that in a second. If you're doing telesales, you're probably on live dials. You're on Zoom. You tell the client, hey, real quick, I'm just going to check with my senior underwriter. Please hold. And then you, you're in the live dials. And hey, guys, what do I do here? You know, and you can resend that stuff. We have underwriting genie, you know, different ways that you can get product recommendations. So the whole goal, when you're brand new is to fill this out in its entirety so that somebody else can tell you what the client best qualifies for. And then we can help create a solution that's going to fit into their budget and solve their problem. So they have to qualify, they have to be able to afford it and it has to solve their problem. Okay. Cause there's plenty of times where somebody's been able to qualify, they've been able to afford it but the solution that I proposed didn't solve their problem or the way that I explained it, I didn't build up enough value that it didn't solve their problem. So I hope that makes sense so far. So medications, medical conditions. Hey, Bob, have you ever had a heart attack, a stroke or cancer? No. Are you diabetic? Yes. Are you taking pills or insulin? Pills. Okay, great. You know, any diabetic neuropathy? Yes. Okay, you're taking gabapentin or Lyrica. You, know, you won't know to ask these questions when you're brand new, but when you do 100 appointments, you'll, you'll already know. You'll start asking the questions. Hey, I had a stroke last year. Okay, what's, what blood thinner are you taking? You, know, you start to just be assumptive. You start to know these things when you do it enough times. Any asthma or COPD, any thyroid issues, anxiety or depression, kidney or liver disease. Guys, the, the crazy thing is, it's not even that crazy. Everybody, whether they're just doing a telesale or they're in the home, they just have these printed out in front of them and they're either filling it out in front of the client or they're filling it out sitting at their desk when they're talking to the client. They use this as their guiding, uh, their guiding way to be able to you know, lead the client through you know, discovery, I guess you could call it. We're discovering what they want what they can qualify for and what their problem is and how to solve the problem. So I circle what medical conditions and just by circling those medical conditions, if they've had a heart attack, stroke, cancer, well, when? So if they had a heart attack, when was your heart attack? 2017, I'll write above heart attack 2017. When was the cancer last you know, treated? 2010, okay? And you're currently diabetic, you know, you currently have COPD, whatever those things are, I wanna make sure I note that. Now, hey, you know, you told me that you're taking, you know, that you, you have these things going on. What medications do you take? Now, when you're brand new, you don't know anything about medications. You're not supposed to know anything about medications. If you guys ever hear some of us live dial and you're like, oh, you're taking the atorvastatin for cholesterol. You're like, well, how do they know that? Just from doing hundreds of appointments. You'll start, you'll start to actually be able to pronounce these medications, believe it or not. You know, it's, you but, everybody butchers them. So don't, don't feel bad about it. Um, everybody butchers it the first time they call their manager um, or the first time they're sitting in front of a client, you're butchering it literally in front of the client and they don't know how to say it either. So don't feel bad. But one of the easiest things you can do as a new agent is say, hey, do you have a list of your medications somewhere or can you go grab the bottles and just have them read it out to you and if it doesn't sound like anything that you can spell, say, can you please spell that out for me? Can you please spell that out for me? You just have to be confident enough to do that. Um, when you're writing the medications, sometimes you might have two or three medications. Sometimes you might have no medications. Sometimes you have to flip over the financial inventory to the back of the sheet and you have 25 medications. Now, again, you know, when you're a new agent, a lot of the times, you know, we're just told, and you know, my goal here is so that number one, you guys know how to fill this out and how you can help the clients best. But number two, if you are a new agent and 
you're asking your manager for help. I want to set you up to fill this out the most complete way, the most detailed way that your manager can help you quickly and efficiently. Because if you've ever been on an in-home call or a telesale call, you call your manager and you say, hey, I've got this, this, and this. And your manager asks you five or six clarifying questions. You didn't do a good enough job filling out your financial inventory. They should know. You know, if I have to ask, hey, did you ask the client this? Did you ask the client that? Hey, can you go ahead and ask them that right now? And then tell me, you didn't do a good enough job filling out the financial inventory. So when I'm going through medications, let's say I've got this list of 10 medications and I have no idea what any of them are. As a new agent, what did I do? I called Grady and I said, hey, you know, I'm sitting here with Bob and Mary, you know, Bob's 74. He's taken lisinopril and gabapentin and Adver and all these things. And maybe Grady knows those medications by heart. Maybe he doesn't. When you call me, for instance, most of the time, when you tell me the medication, I just quickly jump on Google and type in the medication to find out what it's for. I don't have them all memorized. But the best thing you could do is save me a step as your manager and jump on Google yourself. You jump on Google and type in what is it. So you have lisinopril, you type that into Google, it's blood pressure. So put a little parentheses next to it, right? Blood pressure. Uh, gabapentin, that's for neuropathy, put parentheses neuropathy. Metformin, that's for diabetes, parentheses diabetes. Allopurinol, it's for gout. You know, like just write these things down. Doxasosin, it's for bladder control. You know, write it down and guess what? You'll start to actually remember what they're for. But then here's the deal. When you call me, you call Mike, you call Josh, you call Kasha, you call whoever. At the end of the day, when you go, hey, I'm sitting here with Bob and Mary and let me now pronounce all the medications they're taking versus you go, hey, I'm sitting here with Bob and Mary. Bob takes two blood pressure medications, a pill for diabetes and something for gout. They can help you so much faster when you just tell me what the medication they're taking is for rather than, hey, here's this medication. I don't know what it is. I doubt that you know what it is. Can you please look it up for me? Why don't you look it up? Like resourcefulness is a big part of this business and this is how you learn. So you start to figure out what's it for and then guess what? When your manager makes a recommendation of what product to write, you'd be like, oh, okay. So they can, if they, you know, if they're diabetic, but they have no neuropathy, we can still write them America. Oh, okay. I noticed that when there's metformin and there's gabapentin together, Jamie never recommends America because America doesn't accept diabetic neuropathy. He always recommends insert carrier that offers, you know, immediate coverage for neuropathy, you know? So you start to learn these things by doing it over and over and over again. But the goal again is for you to be able to give your manager the best picture of what's going on. So we'll kind of keep going down it and then I'll break down a couple different scenarios and how you can paint the picture back to the client. <coughs> so now I figured out their income. I figured out their expenses. I figured out their medications, their medical conditions. And now you get down to the section that most people skip. Most people skip it all the time. So what do you have in retirement accounts? If you're doing a mortgage appointment, what do you have that could act like life insurance when you die? 401ks, IRAs, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, significant savings. If you're sitting in a normal appointment that's not mortgage protection, do you have any retirement that acts like life insurance? Anything that you can pull out of to leave for your kids? Anything you can pull out of to leave for your wife? Do you have life insurance? Yes or no? That's always important. Yes, I have life insurance. Okay, so I'm assuming that you obviously just wanted to get a little bit more. I'm assuming you're trying to, you know, I just got the life insurance. Okay. So either you're trying to add on a little bit or, you know, you're trying to just get a better price. Which one is it? You know, you want to find out what they currently have. If they have anything, this is where you find out they have work coverage. You get all of these things. And you ask these questions because they're going to help you overcome objections later. So if I find out during the financial inventory that they have work coverage, I'm going to kill work coverage right now in front of them rather than, you know, not asking the question or I ask it, they say I have work coverage and I don't do anything about it. And then I get to the end and they go, well, we're just going to think about it because we have work coverage. Versus I found that out in the financial inventory. I haven't showed any quotes. I haven't showed any numbers. I haven't made my pitch yet. I haven't offered my options. There's no pressure. And I go, what kind of, what kind of coverage do you have? We have work coverage. Hey, well, work coverage is great. Fantastic. You know, you know that, you know, the only downside to it is you don't get to take it with you when you retire. 
It's like a company car. You have to give it back. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, perfect. So that's why we're looking at something private, right? Yes. Now, now it's like you've killed work coverage. Now they can't bring that back up. And if they do, you go right back to where they agreed that work coverage didn't matter. You know, so we're doing this all on purpose for a reason. You know, hey, you know, do you have a will? I love this question. Some people don't think it's significant. This is actually, you know, if you haven't heard us do this before, this is how I find out if they have a bank account. Of all things, like, how do, why is asking if they have a will help find out if they have a bank account? Hey, and do you guys have a will written? No. Okay, perfect. And real quick, who do y'all bank with? Oh, uh, Michigan State Federal Credit Union. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. So I got this website here called doyourownwill.com. It's totally free. All you guys have to do is go to the website, get it printed and go to go up to MSU FCU and get it printed and notarized. And you guys will have an official will. Now I know that they bank at a credit union. Oh no, I don't have a bank account. I use one of those direct express MasterCards because you want to find these things out, bank account, direct express. Cause I can't tell you how many times that, you know, I've done it myself where I've called my manager and been like, Oh, this is an America for sure. And then they tell me it's America. Then I go to run it and I get halfway through the application to find out they don't have a bank account. Then I'm calling my manager back to be like, hey, what do I do? And they're like, well, why didn't you find that out ahead of time? Like there are, there's the financial inventory and what's clearly written on here. And then there's experience where you ask more questions than are on the inventory. My financial inventory is I got writing in the margins all over the place. I've got their expenses on the left side. I've got, you know, their, you know, income loss per person, you know, in one margin. And I've got, you know, whatever life insurance coverage they have, who it's with, what's the monthly payment, what's the death benefit. So I want to know what I'm working with. I want to know exactly what I'm going up against or what I'm trying to strengthen. So we fill this out as much as we possibly can. And now once we have, you know, gotten our recommendation. Our goal is to now use the financial inventory to back up that recommendation. Use the financial inventory to help solve the problem. So in the beginning, we found out why they wanted the life insurance. Now I'm going to show them why the problem they have is real on paper. So now it's no longer just them telling me or me assuming. It's, hey guys, so what I've seen here is that, hey, if Bob dies, there's going to be a $3,000 income loss for Mary. Hey, and if Mary dies, there's going to be a $2,000 income loss for the family. So obviously, if something happens to either of you, it's going to be a little bit harder for you guys to pay the bills or come out of pocket for 10 grand for a funeral, right? Yes. You know, you use the financial inventory to paint the picture, but then also to trial close. So your first trial close was finding out why they filled it out. Your next trial close was telling them the process of what we're going to do today. They agreed to the process. The next trial close is I filled out the financial inventory, and now I'm going to pitch you on my concept of the solution. Not a specific product, not a specific price, a specific death benefit. I'm not showing prices yet. I'm using the financial inventory to illustrate a point that they have a problem and we can solve it. I'm using the financial inventory to paint the picture to them what the financial future of their beneficiary looks like if they don't have anything in place. And this is before I offer anything. I have made no offers of solutions, nothing. But I'm painting the picture using the financial inventory. I think that's huge. Um, I can tell you that there are times when I've been lazy filling out my financial inventory and it's hurt me because there's things that I found out later that would have allowed me to help the client more or to help the client at all because I didn't have that, uh, that tool in my tool belt. I didn't have that leverage to be able to go back to them. And there's times where I've been lazy and I filled out the financial inventory and then I just go, okay, here's the price. And they go, well, we need to think about it. Well, we're not, we're not too sure. Well, when the value exceeds the price, people buy. So when the value exceeds the price, people buy every single time. And we know that the value exceeds the price when I use the financial inventory to help it exceed the price. So it doesn't matter what price I show them, I've shown them they have a problem. And also when someone's like, I can't afford it. Well, why are people saying that they can't afford it? Are people saying that they can't afford it because you made it too expensive for them or because they actually can't afford it? I think that's really important distinction because 
Sean talks about how there's only a couple of reasons people don't buy from you. One, they don't like you. You made it weird for them. Two, they don't trust the company. There's just not enough credibility there. Or three, you made it unaffordable for them. So you have to understand that if you ask them how much money they make and you ask them how much money they spend and you find out how much money they have left over, you know if they can afford it or not. Now, obviously, there's some nuances and different ways, different word tracks that you can say, you know, hey, you know, Al, I know that nobody likes adding another bill. Hey, nobody likes adding another bill. But at the end of the day, this is peace of mind. It's not a bill. So I, wouldn't you agree that if your wife, if you died and the house was paid off for your wife, if you died, your wife didn't have to dig into your retirement to pay for the funeral? Wouldn't you agree that that would give you some more peace of mind at night and it wouldn't really feel like another bill? It would feel like you're, you're doing something for her? Yeah, exactly. You start to learn those word tracks and those come with time. But at the end of the day, you have to learn how to fill out the financial inventory well. Learning how to fill out the financial inventory well allows your manager to help you best. Learning how to fill out the financial inventory well and having your manager help you 20, 30 times in a row, you won't need your manager anymore. You can use the underwriting genie if you get stuck. You can still call your manager, you know, if you got, you know, a tricky one, because, you know, trust me, if you do enough appointments, you'll get a tricky one, you know, at least once or twice a week, you know, even if you're the most experienced underwriter, it happens to all of us, but you use that, like the financial inventory, some people can see things in it that you can't see in it. You know, there's times when I have no idea what to do and I send my financial inventory to someone else on the team, you know, somebody that, you know, I help with underwriting, they help me with underwriting and they see something in the financial inventory that I didn't see. And they go, hey, you did. What about this? Like, I don't know if you thought about that, but this could actually get approved there. You know, so it's important to fill that out. It's important to know why you're filling it out. It's important to know how to use the information that you're taking from the financial inventory. So again, just to kind of recap it all, we're finding out what they bring in. We're finding out what they spend. We're finding out what medications, medical conditions, and surgeries they've had. By finding out these things, we now have a picture. Their life on paper, if someone dies, and our job is to regurgitate back to them what we found. So again, doctor-patient relationship, here's what I found after this line of questioning. Here is what I see as the problem based on what we've you know, come to. Now, here's what I recommend as a solution. Hey, here's what most people in your situation do. You have to learn how to master that right there. Here's what most people do. Here's what most people in your situation do. Hey, listen, I try to treat everybody like they're my mom or my dad. If you were my mom, here's what, my, here's what I tell my mom to do. And you, start, you start saying things like that. And you go, listen, most people in your um in your guys' situation, you know, they want to make sure that they can solve this problem. Wouldn't you agree that, that would make sense for you guys to solve that problem? Couldn't you guys see why solving that problem will be valuable and not a burden? Yes. You trial close, I trial close probably five, six, seven different ways during the financial inventory because now that I've got them bought into the concept, I say things like, perfect, that's why we're here. Okay, perfect. Now I understand why I'm here. I get them bought into why. I get them bought into the solution. And now it's my job to get creative and solve it. So now, obviously, we're not going to dig too deep into all the different underwriting solutions. We're not going to dig too deep into um, how to um, know what product to write. Because that just comes with experience. Listen to your manager. Listen to your manager in the beginning, trust them. Now, here is <clears throat> one of my biggest pet peeves. And this is not pointed at anybody in particular, but it's just happened to me with dozens of agents is somebody calls me for a second opinion, but then they call Josh for a third opinion and Mike for a fourth opinion. Why, why are you doing that? Why are you calling me for a second opinion? Then Josh, then Mike, just listen. And we're all going to tell you probably the same thing. Like, well, hey, Jamie said to do this, but Mike, what do you think I should do? We're all probably going to tell you the same thing. Maybe in certain situations, we might recommend something different. But at the end of the day, there's no reason for you to call two, three, four people. 
get one recommendation, run with it. The reason that we are making a recommendation in a certain way, okay, so there's a couple different reasons. One, we want to get the client immediate coverage. That's number one. That's always number one. If it is possible to get them day one immediate coverage with no waiting period, no grading on the pricing, that's always number one priority. Number two, who is going to pay us the best commission? Number three, who has the easiest electronic application? That is how we're telling you to underwrite in a nutshell. What's going to be the best coverage for the client? What's going to pay you the best? And what is the easiest electronic application? I can't tell you how many times I've had agents where I go, okay, this is the product that I'd recommend. This one pays pretty good commission, but the electronic application is horrible. So I recommend this product over here. So then they go and they run the one that has a horrible application. They go, dude, why did, you, why, why did I even think about writing that product? I was writing the application for two hours and couldn't figure it out. Like I told you, I told you. So you just have to understand, we're telling you guys this stuff from experience. We're telling you from experience. Our goal is for you to be the doctor. Obviously right now it's like you're the doctor in training. If you're brand new, you're like the, the pre-med student who maybe walks out of the room and tells the doctor what you observed. Then you come back in and you, you make your recommendations based on their recommendations. But eventually you're going to get so confident that you use that financial inventory. You know exactly what to do. You paint the picture back to them. You make your recommendation. And guess what? If you fill out a good financial inventory, people should be getting approved most of the time. If you understand how to fill out a financial inventory, you understand how to actually do the underwriting. The underwriting is not that hard. Again, this is not going to be an underwriting training, but guys, we have cheat sheets. We have cheat sheets for everything. We have cheat sheets for you know each product and the bullet points on how to sell each product. We have cheat sheets on, hey, if they are diabetic, and they have high blood pressure, you know, which carriers will take them, which ones won't, A through Z with every medical condition that's most likely to be on an insurance application. All of those things exist. Your job right now is to become a master at the financial inventory. The financial inventory is where you build up all the value. So before you even sit down and you write out the options, because again, this is not a closing training in regards to, you know, hey, here's the three options, 300, 200, 100 a month, pick one. You know, that's not what this is because that'll come. But if you fill out a good financial inventory, you'll know what numbers to offer. You know, you'll know if you can offer max coverage. You know, I was talking to someone the other day and they're like, well, I offered him the $40 a month plan. I go, how much does he make? I go, he goes, I don't know. And I went, how much does he keep? I don't know. I didn't ask. How do you know he couldn't afford max coverage? He goes, well, he just said he just wanted to leave some money behind for his wife and take care of his final expenses. And I heard, you know, 5,000 for cremation and 10,000 for burial. So I just showed him 5,000 and 10,000. Well, he didn't tell you what he wanted to leave behind. You, you like assumed for him. A lot of us, we use our own pocketbook. We use our own perspective on what we think we can afford or what we think they can afford or what we think, you know, based on what they have left over is important to them or not important to them. I've had people who they make 20,000 a month and they go, the $80 a month plan is too expensive. We can't afford that. And I've had people who make 2000 a month and have 400 left over and they go the $335 a month plan. That's what we need. It's that important. <clears throat> you cannot buy for somebody. You can't be assumptive for somebody. So you have to learn how to show what's available to them, <clears throat> what they can qualify for. Obviously we don't want to, you know, pitch too high of numbers but we want to make sure that we're also not pitching too low of numbers because you're just being assumptive and just trying to show them the cheapest things so you can make a sale. You can't be afraid to show big numbers. So I always show max coverage if I know they can afford it. I say, hey, Mary, I'd be doing you a disservice if I didn't show you the max amount of coverage you could qualify for. May or may not be a good fit for you. We can always tone it back from here, but you know, $40,000 American Eagle is $202 a month. You always got to show the max coverage, in my personal opinion. This is what you're eligible for, and uh, I'm required to show it to you. And some people, they jump at that, and that's how you start writing max coverage. I mean, if you look at my last couple policies the last two weeks, every single policy for like the last three weeks has been max coverage. I haven't had any 
policies that have not been max coverage. It's been $450,000 CBO, $40,000 Eagle, $50,000 Aetna, $500,000 Accidental. Max coverage. I show max coverage and people buy max coverage if you're confident and you can show them the value using the financial inventory and why they need max coverage. So that's where I think, you know, I learned this from Jake Conan. Jake Conan wrote over a million dollars worth of insurance last year, Hall of Fame producer, huge agency. He's one of the best insurance producers in the company. If you ever get a chance to watch any of his training videos, FFL Big Sky, highly recommend it. He did this road to Hall of Fame training where he got up on the whiteboard and he shows max coverage at 40000 for a final expense person who could afford it, but there's eyes want to get buried. And he starts creating more value. He goes, hey, so do your kids, uh, do they live local or do they live out of state? They live out of state. Okay, so there's going to be some travel cost in there too. Okay, and you know, you live in an apartment, you got a house, I got a house, house full of a lot of stuff, or you know, you, you, you're pretty minimal. Oh no, I got 30 years worth of stuff. Okay, understood. And you got, you know, cars, you got all these other things. Yes. Okay, so now he starts building up these things and he goes, okay, so here's what we're going to do. 40,000, what that's going to get you, it's going to take care of your burial, but it's also going to take care of travel expenses for your kids. It's also going to give them some money to get a professional cleaning service to come in and get the house cleaned up, cleaned out, listed and sold. It's going to, hey, if you're, if you die, of, if you have a heart attack in your house and you don't die till you get to the hospital, how'd you get to the hospital? Most likely an ambulance. So we're going to bill in some money for ambulance. And he starts just building up thing after thing after thing. And when he shows them the 40,000, the 40,000 is going to be $302 a month. And they go, that's too expensive. Rather than saying, do you want 20,000 for 150? He goes, so do you want to take off the ambulance? Do you want to take off the cleaning service? Like, what do you want to take off? And he starts taking off things rather than money. And now it's like, well, I don't really want my kid to have to clean out the house if they don't have to. So let's leave that on there. Well, I, I don't really want to, you know, I guess, you know, they, they probably shouldn't get, you know, you know, stuck with the ambulance, you know, Bill. And you start to you know, take things off of the value rather than and what those things can do rather than just taking a dollar amount off. So now they're looking at it differently. So again, it's value over price. When the value exceeds the price, that's when people buy. So if you're going to show them 40,000, let's say it's, you know, an equity protection, you know, mortgage appointment. And I go, Hey, you know, your, how much is your mortgage payment? It's 800 a month. Okay. Gotcha. So, you know, over the course of a year, you know, you're probably paying about, you know, $10,000 for mortgage payment. Yeah. That sounds about right for a year. Okay. Perfect. So we're going to leave your son about a year's worth of mortgage payments. That's going to be 10,000. And then you said that, you know, you wanted, you had three other kids, you wanted to leave them 10,000 each. Okay, so 10,000 for each kid and 10,000 for a year's worth of mortgage payments. We're at 40,000. Well, that's too much. Okay, well, how about seven? How about 7,000 per kid? Well, 5,000. Well, I really wanted to leave them 10,000 per kid. Okay, we're still at 40,000. Okay, well, we're going to have to go to six months worth of mortgage payments instead of a year. Well, I really think they should have a year. Okay, we're at 40,000. You see why that's valuable, right? Yes. So you learn to use the financial inventory to figure out what they want, what the problem is, how you're going to solve it. That's the whole goal here, guys. So at the end of the day, my only challenge for you is just to fill out a more in-depth and accurate financial inventory to become a student of the game. And know, you know, how is your manager looking at that financial inventory? Like if, if you're just getting underwriting recommendations on a daily basis and you send the picture of your financial inventory, have you ever thought to stop and ask your manager why they made that recommendation? Call them after the appointment and ask why they made that recommendation. I used to do that all the time. Like, well, dude, how come, you know, last time you told me America, well, how come this time you told me, you know, AIG, you know, last time you told me Aetna, but this time you told me AMM, you know, tell me the difference. I want to learn why, because my goal is to become independent. And that should be everybody's goal is to become independent as quickly as possible. Um, last thing I'll really end with is just that independent thing. There's three stages in building a business. First, you're dependent, then you're independent, then you're dependent on. First, you're dependent, then you're independent, then you're dependent on. I'm dependent on my manager to answer my phone call and help me make a product recommendation. I'm dependent on them to tell me what to do. Now I'm independent. I can write business all day. I don't need any recommendations. I got this. Now I'm dependent on. I brought my first agent in and they're calling me. So if you ever want to get to the dependent on stage, that's where there's leverage. That's where you can create. Uh, residual passive income and create overrides. 
but you got to be a good leader and good leaders are students of the game. The ones who are bad leaders are the ones where you call and you go, Hey, what do I do here? And they go, I don't know. I don't even sell insurance. I'm just here. You know, I'm just your manager. I don't, I don't, I don't even, I don't ever book any appointments. I don't even know what to tell you to do. Call, call Josh. You know, that's, that's not a good manager. You know, you want somebody who's doing it today. Somebody who's in the field on the phones today, they can give you the best recommendation. So that's really my wish for you guys just to become professionals in this, become professionals at uh, using the financial inventory to paint the picture, to help your clients. Um, you know, I'm sure we could do a little bit more of an in-depth training on this with, you know, more role play and we can actually draw it out and show you some different options. I think that would be a good follow-up training to this. But for now, you just know the importance of the financial inventory is, you know, how much money do they make? How much money are they keeping? What can they qualify for? What is the problem that we need to solve? And how am I able to propose a solution to them and paint the picture to them, leveraging what I've discovered on the financial inventory? Simple as that, guys. So I hope everybody has an amazing night. I hope to see y'all at the telesales lock-in. We're going to be doing a lot of this stuff live in person. Cannot wait to see you guys. Sign up, livinghopelockin.com. Talk to y'all next time. See you guys.